Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is part three in our discussion of the voluntary city. In this episode, we talk about the potential for more voluntary cities to develop. So thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Um, yes, hi, uh, my name is David. I would like uh, to ask Peter a question. Um, if uh, it ever came to be that one of the cities that has been you know, uh, top-down governed for like sen uh, for de decades uh, could be transformed to uh, a bottom-up city. What kind of um, problems would you suspect to um, yeah to accompany the transition? Oh my God! Um, <laughs> the short answer a, a is nice, that a nice, nice, easy question for you. Yes, <laughs> the, you didn't warn me. The short, the short answer is I don't know, but. But let me let me mention something else, and that is that um, the the transition is not going to come about, you know, via a constitutional amendment or any kind of a grand stroke. I think the con the the transitions are going on slowly before our eyes, and just as people have been leaving the conventional municipal governments, voting with their feet moving into suburban, smaller cities, moving into private communities, uh, joining business improvement districts in uh, conventional downtowns, in older city downtowns, um, joining, uh, sending kids to charter schools or things like that. I think there are a bunch of transitions going on which are going to continue because people are not stupid and people are going to make choices that are best for them. And I think what's my, my, my theory on this is that we happen to be a society that's wealthy enough whereby we can, we continue to tolerate the bad old stuff while at the same time we invent quite spontaneously and in parallel a bunch of new things. So I think the transition is going on, will continue to go on, not in any kind of smooth, simple way that we would all like, but I think it is going on. I think that people are moving into more and more private arrangements, uh, whether it's private communities or other private arrangements, I think that's happening. Uh, there's an interview with Bill Gates this morning in the Wall Street Journal about education and all the money that his foundation has um, has thrown at education. And uh, he, you know, in the interview, he's rather chastened that, uh, you know, he tried to put a lot of money into conventional school districts and that didn't work out so well. So he's, you know, five billion dollars later, he's learned the lesson that um, maybe the support ought to go in other directions than the conventional school districts. But, you know, I think this is this is happening. I think that um, the charter schools are much the charter school idea is much stronger now than ever, sanctioned by more and more uh, conventional governments. Uh, maybe they don't want to, but eventually they're holding on to an albatross, uh, which they can no longer hold on to. So I, I think I think there is change coming, uh, but I think it's a slow, uh, quite spontaneous bottom-up change. And so I'm I'm optimistic about that. Now I don't think that's a direct answer to your question, but um, may, maybe Jake can answer your question. How's that? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I think it's a very difficult question. Um, I mean, I, I don't know in terms of um, the kinds of um, political um, and sort of social upheaval involved in um, in in if you like privatizing state development processes, um, there's always difficult stuff that happens, but you do see some of it in terms of what has happened with, in, for example, in the UK, in the housing market, you did see from the 1980s a large amount of state stock in housing sold off to the tenants. And right. that, that has had an important effect because it, it has meant that you know, whereas there is a, there is a real physical problem with the design of much of that housing, just putting it in private hands has a big impact on, for example, 
the amount of you know um, sort of maintenance that's required because people look after their own houses and and ha has a it has a, a big impact on some estates. Other estates, um, it, it's not been as su successful, and it's hard to see. Um, you know, without looking at the details, exactly exactly why um, in some and others. And I guess those are the kinds of problems, David, that you see when, when it moves to, when you move from a kind of um, more top-down to, to bottom-up process in development. But I guess, um, you know, the, the big thing that, that comes to mind for me when you say, you know, what about moving from, what, what if cities move from a kind of top-down planning to bottom-up planning? Well, I guess the other thing, that's happening at the moment, which, you know, we, because we're a bit focused on looking at suburbanization, the kinds of things that are happening in developed cities, you tend to lose the, the picture that actually the big thing that's happening in our lifetimes is the shift um, globally to urbanization. So in other words, for the first time in history, depending on how you measure the size of cities, it doesn't really matter. Basically, sometime around now is the first time in history that the majority of humanity has lived in large urban settlements. And most, oh, sure. And most of those settlements in the developing world are unplanned in the way that we would describe them. I, I did quite a lot of research um, back when I was in this field on um, unplanned settlements in South America. And this is what, what happens is, essentially, when you get urbanization, you get a vast number of people showing up and essentially squatting, often on state land. Right. And in that process, streets develop, local shops develop, local shopping streets develop, and what was once, you know, a a slum becomes the you know the urban neighbourhood of twenty years down the line, and that's really very similar process has happened in Euro in Europe with European urbanisation. It's just that it happened two hundred years ago, but right. what we're what we're seeing now in a way, is the unplanned development of large cities in South America, in particular in, uh, in Asia too, um, that, that in a sense is, you know, it's not exactly a market process because there are always state, uh, there's always some kind of state intervention right. of one type or another. But in many ways, you know, it will be very interesting to see what, what the impact is over the sort of next 50 years or so of the fact that as a planet, this is now for the first time a truly urban planet. The, 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 oh, people, yes. the majority of people now live in big cities. Oh, yes. I think it's an important point. You know, one of the things we mentioned in the book uh, when we were wearing our, our optimistic hat is we said something like, We believe we've come full circle. And what we meant is that, as you said, once upon a time, these were mainly private functions. Then they were centralized, and they become very, very top down. And I think uh, you know we're moving away from from the embrace of stop top down and the faith in top down uh, over over some years. Uh, moving away from them in you know very unpredictable ways, which I think is fine. I think that um, you know I think some of you mentioned you know highways and suburbs and so on and so forth. I think there is um, there's the very intriguing question of a division of labor. What, what I mean is that if there's a private developer who builds a private community or a shopping mall or something like that, then that developer is responsible for quite a bit of local infrastructure. Nevertheless, there will be other infrastructure which is provided by conventional means. Uh, state agencies and so on and so forth. I think the division of labor between who provides what is a very interesting question. Uh, I think it'll probably evolve in certain ways. There'll be tugging and pushing and, and dividing and things like that. But I think there's a division of labor unfolding um, in front of us. Let me mention one other point. Um, what well, while I may, uh, there's a pretty nice report from Brookings uh, in Washington, D.C., and I think the author is uh, Alan Berube, if that's how it pronounces B-E-R-U-B-E, -E, I believe. He's looking at the 2010 census data for the metro areas of, of, of the U.S. And he says, you know, it's pretty hard to, to think in terms of the old divisions of central cities and suburbs. And I think that that's correct. I think that, uh, in fact, I mentioned on my, on my blog last night, just responding to this Brookings report, 
that if you go up to San Francisco, for example, or the, what they call the, the Bay Area, uh, it used to be that you know San Francisco was this place where a lot of people had jobs, and then they would uh, commute what they call down the peninsula to the so-called bedroom communities. Well, now downtown San Francisco or the central c- central city of San Francisco is uh, more and more residential, and people find their jobs in the peninsula cities, including Silicon Valley. So I think the the old distinctions are are breaking down, and I think that's a challenge to us too. Anyway, I've talked enough. Go ahead. Great point. Go go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, guys. I wanted to jump in, uh, or I wanted to go back to what you were saying, or someone was saying about um, slums in the third world um, and how they sort of, you know, approximate, you know, a private development. I think that with the residential development, you can definitely see that. You know, they they look, um, they sort of have that look of like a little, you know, if you look in the slums of, you know, Rio de Janeiro or something, they look like, you know, those Greek villages on the hillside where they're all, you know, they're all sort of the same building, but, you know, they're, they're built in sort of an organic and emergent way that looks very nice and very high density. Um, and obviously, you know, they're, they're built privately. The one thing that I worry about those slums, the difference that I see between them and, say, you know, development in the United States 100 years ago, um, is that, you know, they approximate the density of, you know, New York City in its urban days or, you know, other very dense cities. But unlike New York or unlike Tokyo... Um, they do not have very much infrastructure. Uh, and I think the reason is because, you know, in, in these slums, you know, while in actuality the residential development is very free, there's not very many regulations, there are regulations on the books. It's just that they're largely ignored. And in most of these places are democracy. It's, you know, India, a lot of these places in Africa. So, you know, these slum dwellers have some political power. So, you know, the politicians don't dare take away their homes. However, when it comes to infrastructure, those things are still you know, they're still tied up in these old regulations that make, you know, regular residential development also very costly. However, people can get around them because homes are small, you're in the home, you know, you defend it, you vote for it. However, with infrastructure, you know, there's no one sticking up for the rights of a, you know, Rio de Janeiro slum railway owner. You know, if you try to build a railway, the state will come in and they will, you know, take their bribes and, you know, apply all these regulations to it. You know, you can't hide a um, you can't hide or defend a train like you can your home. So I guess I just worry that in these places, the residential development and, you know, the, the actual buildings are, you know, proceeding apace, but the infrastructure is not getting built because um, it's not legal. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I want to say about slums. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, just to add to that, I think the, the key there is, is property rights. And, and I mean, the, the real issue is that although settlements in India, South America and so forth are happening too fast for the state to clear them, but they do absolutely clear them. And I mean, slum clearances, unfortunately, are like a sad fact that, that a lot of the reason that um, that they are built of, of red, that especially the slums that are relative poor materials, is because the guys who are there know that there is a potential that they're going to get bulldozed. And so they don't want to invest in mm-hmm. larger two or three story structures or brick structures because it's expensive. And if it gets bulldozed, you've got to start all over again. But I think you're absolutely right, um, Stephen, that the, the impact then is that if you don't have secure property rights, you cannot do capital investment. You can't do infrastructure investment. You can't build, you know, trams or things like that because those kinds of larger scale projects really require some certainty about your property rights and about your ability to invest for a longer period of time and know that you're still going to be able to, you know, to, to get the income that will come from those projects. So it's all, it's kind of limited. Those cities are limited to what you can do on the fairly small scale. Um, and, and that is a real, you know, that, that's a real problem. Interestingly, where there are some cases, and there are cases where in, in some countries like Chile and, and other places where programs were implemented in the 90s and, uh, and uh, in other periods too, I just happen to know about that one, where <coughs> deeds to the land were given out to basically formalize these informal settlements and to create a more, well, to legalize them. When that happens, you see a huge step change in the quality of building infrastructure that goes in because people then have... They have the property rights. They have more um, certainty about making investment. And that's when, you know, um, uh, local 
entrepreneurs can um, uh, collaborate on on developing things. I don't think it really goes to sort of the mass transit type thing because those are very large scale schemes. But still, you know, you do see buses and uh, local shopping streets and and other um, you know quite diverse businesses in in those areas. Right, right. You, you get limited to sort of small scale transportation things. You see a lot of motor taxis and you know share taxis and things like that. But you know, it's really hard to build. You know, yeah. That's what I'm getting at.